you guys are supposed to, according to NAVC, you're supposed to take a welding course. If you actually look at what NAVC puts in there, it's welding metallurgy. And it's sort of because, like I've sort of, I told you a couple of times, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you see every problem is a nail. Um, and the people at NAVC, uh, a lot of them, uh, historically, a number of the welding people at NAVC have come out of Lehigh or Rensselaer or Polytechnic or two big metallurgy schools. John Lippold, who wrote the, you know, metal, a couple of the welding metallurgy books we've been using um, a little bit, came out of RPI. He was one of Savage's last star okay? Um, and so when people at NAFC sit down and they say, we have welding problems, they seem think that you can solve all welding problems with metallurgy, okay? But you can't. Sometimes, you know, hopefully you understand it's design, it's metallurgy, it's process control will keep the hydrogen out or, or chemistry control. Well, chemistry control is metallurgy, okay? But I decided in the first year I was a faculty member that I wasn't going to compete with all those high power welding metallurgists out there, and I was going to go and look at welding physics and chemistry, the processes. And I developed my own courses, which were solid state and fusion. And for a number of years, that's basically what you guys got, you guys mean the Navy officers, the EDOs got, instead of welding leverage. And then I sort of appended on a little bit of welding leverage in 1998. Professor Masabushi had been teaching welding leverage. He was a professor of ocean engineering um, and had helped build submarines in Japan during World War II. And that was kind of his, his expertise. Uh, he was building real ships. Um, and in any case, so it sort of evolved that you guys are supposed to now take um, one in the, in the last couple of summers, you'll see summer of 2013, summer of 2014. And if you went back further in solid state welding, you know, you know, you know, look, there's, there's some others, you know, archive of older courses, you'd find that I taught solid state welding probably in 2012. Well, no, I taught, taught codes and standards with that. In the summer. Um, but in any case, it's sort of been agreed that that's what you guys would take. Now, I say Shaq could overrule me. He could sit down and say, look, you guys could have the same choice that Adrian has. He's a free agent. He can do whatever he wants. Okay? He's paid his tuition. He can... Because there's some other courses, so you might be interested in materials and selection or codes and standards. And in fact, I think it would be better for you know, there's 10 of you or whatever, to kind of pick five different things and each of you take two of them or something. You know, you know, two of you take those. And then you can get together and talk about, well, he told the same story here that he did over here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Correlated stories. <laughs> whatever. Okay. There are actually quite a few well, stories. I guess I've heard. Anyway. Um, but anyway, I, I don't think you have to, you know, the same type of thing is, Oh, they, they have to have such and such where they're going to be deficient. Well, they only get 60 on the exam, so they're missing 40% of it anyway, right? And none of this is going to turn you into a corrosion expert or a welding expert. You're going to be managers, okay? And you need to know enough to be dangerous, okay? And ask the people who are responsible for it some tough questions. But so far as being the problem solver, you've got to manage solving the problem. You don't have to solve it. You've gone through that. You've already passed that part of your career. Okay? Now you get a dump it on others. Okay? You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I don't care which ones you take. Okay? But you are supposed to take two more modules that are on the YouTube videos from this list. And I would encourage you, even though you're getting all excited about your math courses now, mm -hmm. uh, because they have quizzes and other things that get you excited, <laughs> um, I would encourage you to yeah, you can take tomorrow off or something, but um, you could even take next week off. But after the 4th, start watching these things. Don't put it all the way up until August, okay? Don't procrastinate. All you have to do is watch it. You know, one student told me, he uh, during the school year, told me he used to watch it when he was fixing dinner in his apartment. He would just put it on, sort of like the evening news, and, you know. So, after all, you're not going to be quizzed on it, you know, so. Okay, so that's that. Uh, and seriously, I, I, I have, I keep on telling you you're supposed to take these other two 
but I don't care what you take. Okay, you can tell I don't care what you take. And uh, in fact, that's a, that's a story too. Um, when when Apple's Apple computers first came out with the ability to change the the little buzzer or click that you hear when you hit the wrong key or something, um, you could put you could you could record some message so it says something else. So one of my graduate students had me come in. Well, I get in early. So he had me go down to the student's office. He gave me a little sheet, told me how to do it, and I recorded "Who cares?" as one of the the alerts <laughs> because that was what I always told my graduate students. You know, they tell me about something. I said, "Well, who cares?" I mean, they, the point is they were always worried about trivia. Okay, and so which course you take, who cares? Okay, now people use the term whatever. Okay, so one of the things you should know about aluminum, to finish up some aluminum, is aluminum, just like steel and most metals in the molten state, will dissolve lots of hydrogen. Uh, but it does do the same thing of hydrogen and brittlement that it does in steel and some other metals, because it's space center cubic. And space center cubic metals can store lots of hydrogen. But in the liquid state, you've got about 10 times the solubility. This is on a log scale, folks. So you've got 10 times the solubility of the liquid as you have in the, in the uh, solid when it solidifies at 1220 degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens is the more moisture in the air that you have, the more porosity you get. The hydrogen comes out as bubbles on solidification. And I guess I could have brought in, well, you wouldn't have seen it on the x -rays. There's an ASTM standard for aluminum castings or um, other and aluminum wells, and they basically have reference radiographs, and they'll have eight different radiographs with increase. This is like three to show you almost no. There's one little four over here, and you could maybe think you got some. These are X-rays of wells. You got more here, and you got a bunch here. This would be an eight. This would be a one. This might be a three in terms of the scale of severity, and that's how you do it. You just do a visual comparison and say, oh, it's somewhere between a four and a five. Usually for high quality, aircraft quality, aluminum castings, or high quality welding, they, it must be class two or less. So it's gotta be class one or two. You never have aluminum castings that don't have a little bit of porosity, okay? Um, and in fact, you don't have titanium welds that don't have a little bit of porosity. Now some of these things can be 10 thousandths of an inch. And that's this Boeing story I was gonna tell you about. I might as well tell you now. The uh, Boeing, when they're coming out with 747 400, this was like the late 80s. And this was an extended range. You get the weight out, increase the fuel capacity, and fly it an extra 1,000 miles because at that point they're probably eight or 9,000 miles. And you'd like to have 11,500, which is the mileage on a great circle from the two largest cities. You know, the greatest distance on a great circle for major cities of the world. It's kind of like going from New York to Sydney, Australia, or something like that. I don't remember, but it's, it's a, you know, there's only a couple of routes. You don't have to be 12,500 because there's no half great circle, okay, with, between two and three cities. It's always something a little bit less. But you'd like to be able to, to fly that distance. And of course, you have a little bit of safety factor in case you hit weather or something, so you don't just have to ditch into the Pacific. Um, at least when you're going to Australia. Coming back, you might have to just ditch in the West Virginia. Anyway. Um, but in any case, um, so they were trying to lightweight it. I didn't tell this story before. Did I? The, uh, they have they have a, a uh, there's ozone up there, and if you breathe ozone, you'll get a headache on these long flights. If you breathe that much ozone, it's also considered a carcinogen. So they have catalytic converters for the air that's coming into the cabin to get rid of the ozone, okay, so you can breathe it. And they had used stainless steel um, uh, venting, um, you know, ductwork, if you will, very <coughs> cylindrical ductwork, but they were switching to titanium. Big increase in price, but same way, okay, and they tried to save every pound they could to get more fuel. And I just got back from a trip to Japan, and they called up out of Engelhardt, New Jersey. They had the contract, and it was about to hold up the whole plane. I haven't told the story yet. Okay, this would get to be the critical path for rolling out the 747-400. At that time, $100 million plane now, so it's about $40 million. But, um, 
and Englehart was going to be the supplier who kept it from going on its first scheduled flight, right? So it's just sort of like giving the ship out of port on time. Okay? And so I, I didn't have time. I'd been gone for two weeks. And I asked, I told them, look, when you're, they, and what it was is they had porosity in their titanium because of hydrogen, same thing as aluminum, okay? And I said, look, look, all you have to do is clean it really well and don't use acetone. Acetone will leave a little bit, most commercial grade acetone has got some oils in it. You need to use reagent grade. I said, get some reagent grade acetone. I got the exact same story up here at General Electric Lynn and they're welding $70,000 titanium compressor parts, electron beam welding. And I, I told the guy the same story twice, just several years apart. I said, get some acetone, get some reagent grade acetone, clean it right before you weld it, and weld it, and you'll, you'll be fine. Well, Boeing tried to do it, and they could not Boeing, Englehart tried to do it. The spec that Boeing had was they could not tolerate a, any porosity, a single pore greater than 10 thousandths of an inch. Well, what if I had a pour? First of all, a single pour is not going to cause the thing to fail. You do the fracture mechanics on it, it won't cause it to fail. It's not going to cause a brittle fracture. It's not going to cause a fatigue fracture. This, this thing hardly has any stress on it, okay? It's just duct work. So we've got 14 PSI on this, you know, you know uh, can't be less than that, can't be more than an atmosphere, right? Much more than an atmosphere. Um, anyway, so they couldn't do it, so they called me back and I said, oh, look, I'm going to be down in New Jersey for something else. Instead of, as soon as I finish, if you guys will stay late that day, I'll come by. So I, I came by at 6 o'clock, just got a later flight home. And I, they walked me through it, and I said, uh, and I showed them how to clean it, okay? And I left, and they, turns out, they had successful welds for the next, their next four welds were defect free. They were all delighted and everything. They called me up and I said, fine. Okay. Then they called me up a month later. So, oh, we've been making, we're back to our same failure rate. And I said, guys, will you follow the cleaning procedures that I showed you before? Because they've already fallen off the map on our cleaning procedures, right? They could keep cleaning like, anyway. And they finally got it out and, and stuff. The exact same thing up at here on great big $70,000 compressor <laughs> parts. It was an old engine. I was told I was doing research for General Electric at the time. And the guy called me up and said, Tom, can you help us out? I said, sure. I said, and I told him, wow, get some reagent grade acetone. Because if you leave a little oil film on there, guess where hydrogen comes from? Okay? From the oil film. Well, he said, oh, by the way, we don't, this is an old engine, we don't have any development money, so can you do it for free? Okay, I had a research contract with them, so I just consider this part of the song. So I go up there and spend a half a morning, and I don't know, maybe it wasn't as well an engine. There were 17 managers and engineers from General Electric watching me do the inspection as the technician cleans the surfaces to prep them for putting in the electron beam chamber to melt. Chamber to melt. And I, I get down, and I, after he cleans it, and I noticed he wasn't using reagent grade acetone like I told him to. And he, he's looking at it. He, he, I get down and I, I get a little 10x magnifier and I'm looking at it. And I go back to the area I just looked at. And I noticed there are white specks that weren't there 60 seconds before. And I said, guys, this room is raining dust, white dust on here. And the foreman starts pushing me aside. Well, he would have already done this if you hadn't been in the way. You know, He would have had it put together and in the chamber. OK, fine. And at that point, all the engineers and managers figured I was just a buffoon, and they quit paying attention to me. I went over and had a little glass slide on the bench. I cleaned it with my handkerchief as well as I could. I took some of the acetone that they had in a little squeeze bottle. I squirted it on there, blew it off, evaporated it, held it up, and you could see Newton rings of color from the oil that was in it. It's a little, the story's even longer than that, but. In any case, at the end of the morning, I, I left. I, they, they had a leak in the vacuum chamber, and they couldn't make the weld. They wanted me to stay and watch the weld. What are you going to see inside the chamber? Uh, anyway, so I said, wow, I told you six weeks ago, get some reagent grade acetone. He got some reagent grade acetone. The next three of these parts, they welded. No, no pores, no problem. And Lyle calls me up and tells me that by using reagent grade acetone, which I told him for free, 
six weeks before, um, that he solved the problem, and all he got was a letter of commendation. I said, well, wow, I didn't even get a letter. Oh, no. <laughs> I was doing this for free. But anyway, you get porosity from hydrogen in titanium. The story about the Boeing spec, they had no reason to have a spec that was that tight. And it over-specified the system, okay? But there are some specs that you have to meet, okay? Um, in fact, I'm, I'm, July 5th, I'm going out to Caterpillar because I was an LGO student out of Caterpillar. And he's been told to come up with a new physical inspection technique to inspect fillet welds. Well, you know, everybody's already taken all of the electromagnetic spectrum and the mechanical end, uh, frequency spectrum to do, whether it's ultrasonics or whatever, to do inspection of wells. But he's supposed to find some new spectrum, some new physical uh, thing. And then he, he just emailed me this week and he says, he went out to operations and talked to this manager and she said, she didn't really want a new inspection technique because it would be a new specification that she would have to meet. Okay. So she said, that happened to me 30 years ago in an electric boat. I had a better way to inspect wells. And they threw me out of the shipyard, practically, because the last thing they wanted was a new criteria they had to meet. Right? So that's what we need to talk about. Okay. Um, uh, so far as porosity and how bad it is in aluminum, it really is not that big a deal. Um, so here's full tensile strength versus amount of porosity if you have essentially a core free weld, which doesn't really exist, but anyway, in theory, very low. This is 7039. Uh, this is um, one of the aerospace uh, high strength alloys. Uh, you lose some strength pretty much linearly proportional to the uh, amount of uh, porosity you have, up to 30%. Uh, the elongation goes down because each one of these pores is a fracture site and it changes the way it fractures a little bit. But in fact, you can tolerate 5% porosity. It's not a big deal. Within the noise, it's all the same strength. Kind of with porosity in this case, you're talking about the kind of the summation of all of the bubbles, or, yeah. or if you have one large volume one fraction. Okay. Volume fraction across the thing do how big the largest one is. Uh, they're all going to be small because they form on solidification. Uh, and so they're going to be similar. Well, you saw the variation. They might vary by a factor of three or five in size. But some of that is the fact, well, those are projections. So they might vary by a factor of three to, si three to five, but they're all sub millimeter size. Okay? So in terms, none of them are eighth of an inch. You have, if you, it's not porosity if it's an eighth of an inch, then it's a void. Okay, and, you know, it's caused by something else. Okay, but in general, porosity is not that big a deal. Okay, um, we're not going to talk any more about it. We'll start going on titanium. So titanium, there are um, titanium is of interest in part because it has excellent corrosion resistance and it's lightweight. And the fact is it's horrendously expensive to fabricate. It has nothing to do with anything in the aerospace business. Aluminum has no phase transformation like steel. Steel goes from high temperature space center cubic to body center cubic. You can heat treat it, you can get high strength in both aluminum and steel by aluminum by precipitation hardening. Titanium does have the advantage that steel has because you do have a body center cubic high temperature phase, let's see, and a hexagonal close pack low temperature phase. So you've got alpha and beta, and sometimes you have an alloying element such as aluminum, oxygen, nitrogen, or carbon, and you raise the alpha stability um, as you add it in. And if you add vanadium, molybdenum, niobium, and tantalum, you decrease it. So these are called beta stabilizers, so these are called alpha stabilizers. And in fact, most of the time, you want to sort of make it neutral, so you throw a little aluminum or a little vanadium. The workhorse alloy for titanium, just like 304 was for stainless steel, and 6061 was for aluminum, uh, heat treated. Uh, the workhorse alloy for titanium is titanium, six aluminum, four vanadium. And if any of you have been to the Watertown Mall, which used to be the U.S. Army's Watertown Arsenal back in the days of the Civil War, and even until about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, with the BRAC closing, the Army had a, a full—not a full-size reactor, but a 
it was a research reactor the size of this building, okay? Um, and when they were in the first BRAC closing, the movement to Aberdeen, Maryland, they said, oh, you can't close up, so it'll cost $50 million to shut down the reactor and decontaminate, decontaminate the area. And the DOD said, so what? You know, uh, they closed up. Uh, but now they turned it into a mall, so when you eat, you can eat with a little extra radiation. Actually, yes. actually, they're about a half a mile away. But it goes for about a mile along the river. But that's where Hikating 6 Aluminum 4 Vanadium was developed <coughs> by the Army at work down our soul in the, um, just after World War II. I thought the Army had all their keys and all their reactors taken away back in like the 50s. I thought those accidents they had. Well, they probably, they probably did. I'm not sure this one had ever worked uh, in <laughs> my lifetime. I was okay. surprised to hear they had some as recently as even 20 years ago. Well, I used to help them with failure analyses over there because they were members of the MIT Industrial Aviation Program. I would stop by on the way home and look at some rocket motor case or something that had failed, help their failure analyst um, look at things. And uh, I remember walking through the reactor area. There was no, it wasn't operating. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't have been walking through there. And I remember when they were starting to clean it up, they had grid lines, one meter grid lines that put down with tape everywhere because they had to go and decontaminate square meter by square meter. Jeez. It was pretty exciting. Uh, but, and I thought, I've been walking through our area all this time. Um, if you look at the composition of the metallurgy of titanium alloys, they kind of fall in three groups, or three different industri industries. Well, to a certain extent, industries. The first group is commercially pure unalloyed titanium. Some of the grades have a little bit of palladium um, in them, which is a precious metal like gold. The price of gold, they only got a, a quarter of a percent max. But these have excellent corrosion resistance in certain types of acids or whatever in some chemical plants. Just a little bit of palladium significantly improves things. But basically, you've got all these different grades which change their oxygen content. Which here's oxygen. You get higher strength. Where's my, where's my strength? I don't have the strength on this one. Maybe I better pull it on another block. Oh, similar type things. Um, so here's another plot of the unalloyed grades. And hopefully, okay, here's the yield strength in uh, megapascals or KSI, 25, 40, 55, 70. It's increasing directly with the oxygen content. Just like carbon hardens steel, oxygen hardens titanium, okay? So oxygen is an alloying element, particularly for the commercially pure grades, which are usually used in sheet metal uh, or tubes or heat exchangers and things like that. Or who was talking about Schedule 10 titanium piping? Or you were, okay? It's pretty thin stuff, right? Um, and it's thin because you're trying to save money. The titanium might be costing you, unalloyed might be $30 a pound. These alloys down here could be $100 a pound after you roll them into plate and everything else. Um, if you get down to the alpha, um, alpha near alpha alloys, this is where titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium should be in here somewhere. Where is it? I don't know, it's down here, alpha beta alloy. And it's got 120 KSI pencil. The Navy's alloy, I thought I had that on one of these things. This is my other block. Yeah, it's probably my other block. Um, has this H, is TI 100, just like. HY100 or HY80 or HY130, the Navy's alloy is, and only the Navy uses this, and they don't really use it. But they develop their own alloy, six aluminum, two niobium, one talon, 0.8 molybdenum. So rather than vanadium, they use these, a combination of these. And it's about 100 KSI strength. It is called TI100 uh, in, in jargon parlance. It's less strength than the 6.4, which is sort of aerospace alloys. So these are heavy forgings and plates and stuff. Um, the Seacliff was built out of Ti-100 because they weren't, like I said, they prototyped 
larger and larger things. First they start making little laboratory specimens, little well specimens the size of a, a notebook. Uh, they test those for properties and then they'll do a prototype development. Uh, might be 6-4 funds uh, from the Navy and you know, the Sea Cliff was such a project. They, um, they had built the Alvin, the original Alvin submarine, which the Office of Naval Research built for just doing scientific studies and other type things, was uh, made of, with a steel hull, okay, high strength steel. My, I don't know if it was HY-180 or HY-130, because uh, it was back in the 60s. By the early 70s, the Navy had switched to titanium for the Alvin hull. It was 6'4". As I remember. And the, the Alvin they just got rid of and built a new Alvin. That was the same titanium hull from the early 70s up to the last for about 40 years. And the, uh, the new hull is also titanium. But in about 1980 or so, they built the Sea Cliff, which was a little bit larger than the Alvin. You could actually stand up in it. Okay? So these things are about, I think the Alvin's about a seven foot sphere, and the Sea Cliff was an eight foot diameter sphere. Okay. It's the same thing as the NR1, I don't know if anybody's familiar with No, NR1 I think is a little mini sub. Oh. I'm pretty sure it's slightly different. They've had, the Navy's built lots of little subs, okay, for research purposes. In fact, Draper Lab had one a few years ago. They had to build two of them. And these are actually hot dog shaped subs, not spheres. And they were going to make them out of titanium and it's a quarter inch thick, and they were going to be like four feet diameter. They were autonomous vehicles, oh, okay? Yeah. And they came to me because I had done welding on titanium. And Draper Lab hired me. And as I remember, they told me, per DOD regs or their contract, they could only pay me $50 an hour. <laughs> they were on a rapid prototyping schedule. This was the mid 90s, or early 90s. After the first Gulf War, that was a big thing, was rapid prototyping. It was a big thing in the Navy. <clears throat> because they had certain equipment they needed built to fight in Iraq for the first war, and one of the reasons they waited for six months to invade was because they were trying to get these new systems for desert fighting operational. And so they had a big program at DARPA and other places to rapid prototype, and they were gonna rapid prototype two autonomous four foot diameter, I think they were 50 feet long or something, subs. I was not to know anything about the mission, but it was public knowledge they were building these subs, and Draper had the contract. Turns out it's only a quarter of an inch wings stiff and cylinders, just like any, just like a bigger sub. Um, and if someone knew it was a quarter inch, they, they could probably figure out how deep it would go. But I never had any idea what the mission was. Um, but uh, we ended up building them in aerospace facilities. We went down to Pratt and Whitney, places like that, where they're building titanium parts that are four feet in diameter, four jet inches. Okay, so they basically used aerospace fabrication facilities to make the titanium for those type of prototypes. The sea cliff, uh, one of the things they wanted to do was they wanted to weld heavy section because the sea cliff, I don't remember, is around two inches, it might have been two and a quarter inches wall. And it was supposed to go to 6,000 meters or even deeper. You no, know, that's a fair part of the ocean, okay? Um, and they tried, and they were building at Mare Island, and they were trying to use gas metal arc welding, which is what the David Taylor Annapolis uh, group had been working on for years, was gas metal arc welding, where you feed in a wire, you have argon shielding, and they couldn't do it. And they finally gave up and went back to what they call hot wire TIG. One of you talked about TIG welding, where it comes to electrodes and you can feed the wire in. That's how they built it. The difference is hot wire TIG is two pounds an hour Deposition rate, pretty mm. slow. Gas metal arc would have been 10 pounds an hour, five times the productivity, but they couldn't do it. Okay, and I'll tell you some more stories about that in a second of how you weld heavy section titanium. But anyway, there there are uh, various classes of, of alloys. One of the problems in the titanium business is it's not a big enough industry. To sustain its own steel, its own rolling and melting capacities, so it uh, basically they borrow time, they rent time in a steel mill. One day in a steel mill can roll all the titanium they need for a month in the titanium industry. Okay, 
okay? They can't afford a half a billion dollar rolling mill in the industry, titanium industry. So they have to go roll it in a dirty old steel mill, okay? Which creates its own problems of rolling in iron oxide and everything else. But they learn to do it because they don't have a choice, okay? But we never had a big titanium industry. The Soviets did, and the Soviets built, as you know, the alpha subs. And I think it was, I can't remember, I, first time I ever went abroad was 1979. I remember I first read about the Alpha Subs on the front page of the International Herald Tribune flying back from Europe. Okay? That was either 79 or 80. Um, and uh, so I read about it. I had my first research contract in MIT almost well, 13 months to the day after I started as an assistant professor was to do submerged arc welding of titanium, okay, for the office research. And these are some of those wells we made back in the late 70s um, of submerged arc welding of titanium. Uh, so I'll pass them around. This is not too bad looking bead. It has lousy uh, contact angle. It's got a 90 degree uh, angle. It doesn't kind of blend in. This is another one with different flexes, uh, which is all ropey. Um, uh, it turns out the Soviets had been publishing work, a guy, Gurevich. Here's Gurevich's book. Ta-da! Many yeah. people can read. I know the Cyrillic alphabet. and can read uh, Russian or Ukrainian, whichever one. He was at the Pataan Welding Institute in the, in the Soviet Union, in the Ukraine, in Kiev. And it turns out here in 1980, April 1980, the U.S. Air Force translated that book, which is Metallurgy and Technology of Welding Titanium. My copy has a nice little letter on the inside from <coughs> Boris Medivar, who was one of the top five scientists. Uh, he was sort of interesting in his own right. But anyway, we're glad to send you the book of our S2 colleagues, whatever that is, Metallurgy and Welding Titanium. Yeah. The S4 during our visit to your laboratory in MIT, B.I. Medivar. I still get Christmas. Actually, I don't get Christmas cards from Medivar. I get them from Cotton Hands. But anyway, um, they're nice people. Okay, uh, and I could tell you stories about when this was Jimmy Carter, President Carter had an exchange program with the Soviets in the 70s. Um, and we had science, Soviet scientists coming to MIT and RPI and other places. And the guy who headed this whole program up was a professor in this department, Nick Grant. He had headed it up for the National Science Foundation for the whole country. And the first time, 30 American scientists went over to uh, the Pataan Institute. The next time they had an exchange, um, uh, I think eight went, and the next time two went. This was in 1980, and President Reagan was trying to shut this down. Carter was out, Reagan was in, and uh, Reagan didn't see any bad value of cooperating with the Soviets. And I was one of those two people. I was still, I was a young, untenured professor. But Julian Sakelli, who's now passed away, was in this department. He still had an NSF contract. He needed to do this to satisfy his NSF contract, which was part of the State Department thing. And he wanted someone to go with him. And I could give you an interesting lecture about being followed constantly by the KGB. They had about 40 people following the two of us. Um, anyway. But I got to talk to Garavich. And Gurevich had been publishing all this stuff in the 1960s, and about 1972, all of a sudden, he quit publishing. That was when they decided to build the office sub office. And all the work that he had done at the time is too. I estimate if it had been us in 1972 or whatever dollars, the work he did from the 60s to the early 70s was probably $100 million worth of research on welding titanium. More than we ever spent on HY80 and HY100, so because um, it's harder to weld, but he did it, and we had determined that we should be using submerged arc welding. Submerged arc welding is used for steel all the time. Big line pipe, like the Alaskan pipeline, was done by submerged arc. The longitudinal seams are done by submerged arc, and you have two plates, they can be an inch thick or two inches thick or whatever, 
and you essentially feed in granular flux. It looks sort of like sand. And you have a wire that feeds in, and it's submerged underneath the, the flux of sand. I mean, you can have an arc right there, and you can be standing next to it, no shielding or anything, because it's all you're all welding under sand. Okay, but it's a very special sand. It's like the it's formulated for steel, like the coatings on these electrodes, but in granular form. This process was developed in the United States about 1936, and there's a letter from Churchill to um, or from Roosevelt to Churchill at the beginning of World War II. This was they talk about a welding process, which you would think was the Union Carbide Union Mill process, that had been developed in 1936, and this was one of the ways we were building ships. And it was a tremendous advantage, because you can lay down 30 pounds an hour, not two, two or four pounds an hour, but 30 pounds an hour with this product. Very productive, only works in the horizontal position, get great big welds, okay? So we figured this would be a way to build a heavy section titanium submarine, or um, anyway, so that was my first research contract to develop the fluxes. And if you go through Gurevich's book, half of this book is on how to make the fluxes, and how to make them pure enough. I ended up using optical quality calcium chloride crystals that I was buying for hundred dollars a pound and crushing their single crystals. I was crushing them up into a sand and welding underneath. Okay, and with that, I could. If you look at these pieces uh, that I sent around, this is sample number 13, 28 volts, 450 amps, 8 to 12 mesh, which is this optical grade calcium chloride. It had 0.14 oxygen and 0.015 nitrogen, which is very good chemistry, almost better than the base plate. Okay, and in fact, if you use optical quality calcium chloride, you can actually refine the oxygen out of the well pool. My first student ever, John Galati, who ended up as an engineer of electric boat, that was his bachelor's thesis. He made those wells. Okay, turns out we very quickly learned that you couldn't afford the flux. It was going to cost you about um, $300 a foot of weld just for the flux. That doesn't seem to sound very good. Okay, And then about the same time, we started learning the Soviets had built an alpha sub. So they had, con they had conferences, they weren't classified because they couldn't get the clearances through quick enough. But we went down to Annapolis, David Taylor, Annapolis, and we had conferences. How are we going to match the Soviets? Congress was not happy. This was sort of the Navy spot. Okay? The Soviets got to send a dog in space before we ever got any living creature other than maybe a few roaches in space. Um, and that created a big awareness and increasing the research and stuff. Well, this was, Congress was unhappy that they had, uh, the Soviets had, had leapfrogged us in submarine technology. So we were having conferences and they were running scared. And I was at one of these conferences, not David Taylor, and listening to other people's presentations and stuff. And, as, and I'm thinking back about the papers I had read on Gurevich. And all of a sudden, I think it was the second day of a three-day conference, I just said, oh, electro slag. That's how they had to have done it. Okay, this is probably 78 or 79. Gurevich had published a lot of work on electro slag. The electro slag process is a welding process that had been perfected back in World War II for steel by, uh, at the Paton Institute by Boris Paton's father. Boris Paton's father was a a hero of the Soviet Union, you know, it's a big star-shaped metal mm -hmm. stuff. You've seen in his pictures. Uh, because he used to weld the Soviet Soviet tanks back together and get them back to the you know to the Russian front fighting the Germans. Um, and he was credited with a lot of his welding technology, or successfully welding armor seals in World War II, of helping have enough tanks to keep the Germans at bay. Anyway. You basically have two water-cooled copper dams, you have two vertical plates. So if you were to think about Quonset Point and how they weld these things vertically, Quonset Point, by gas metal arc for steel. I mean, that's not kept classified. Okay, that's all known. You can see reports by General Anderson and Open Literature about what they do, some of the things they do at Quonset Point. You basically, for thick plates, it can be anywhere from one to six inches thick. 
you basically feed a wire in and you just put some flux in the bottom. So now you're using half a pound of flux where you might use 10 pounds of flux in submerged art. Well, I can afford 30, 15 or 30 dollars of flux. And I can make a weld that's 20 feet tall in the same batch of flux in principle. Um, I didn't have Gurevich's book at the time, but I realized this would be a very efficient process and they had certainly spent lots of time and money on fluxes. And this was a flux shielded process we never even thought about um, in terms of, because electric slag on steel is sort of a lousy process. Turns out it's a great process on titanium. I handed this out in the first day. This is a titanium electric slag weld, in two inch thick plate. There's the weld between there. Two inch thick weld, no distortion. Can only be made in the vertical direction. This was made at Oregon Graduate Center. The first titanium electro slag weld made in the free world was made in the room right next door. It was terrible. No fusion. But we made it. We came, I came back from that little conference and had, had my student make a weld. It wasn't much of a weld. But I proved it. Boy, you can really lay down titanium metal in these fluoride fluxes uh, very quickly. At that point, the Navy class. <laughs> So I can't work on it anymore, and they send it out to Oregon Graduate Center with it. Yeah. yeah. What's uh? Obviously, the flux shields the shields the uh, the load of the mass is just on the bottom. So the bottom, so the hot metal hits the flux and melts it shields that bottom portion. Well, if you've got this is the the side walls, and you've got a molten bath. This is the, the melted steel, right? The liquid liquid. And you've got a wire coming in. You actually have a bath of melted flux. Oh, that floats on top. Floats on top. Oh, okay. It's not an arc weld. You're resistively heating through the resist the flux. The flux has a certain electrical resistance. How are you adding metal? The wires are feeding in. You oh, see the okay. spool of wire at the top feeding in? So oh, the wire melts itself through resistive yeah, heating. Through resistive heating. Oh, wow. So you're just you're making a little casting. And the problem was it melts so efficiently that we basically didn't get infusion to the sidewalls. At the end, you can take a hammer and hit it, just one inch thick plate. You can hit and knock, knock it apart because we were just the titanium, it wasn't fusing the sidewalls with any regular. Um, but it turns out um, we learned that was one of the ways they welded stuff. And I shouldn't tell you too much about how I know, but I've only had to use the security clearance twice. Uh, but they, they did get some foreign technology. I went down to David Taylor a year later, and I, I was amazed. I didn't know you could get something that big out. <laughs> okay? Um, but, I mean, someone basically robbed the scrapyard and shipyard. <laughs> <laughs> okay? I'm not kidding. Okay? I mean, this is 30 years ago, 35 years ago, so I don't mind telling you that much, okay? But they had the technology, okay? They, or they had the wells. Uh, and then I came down to see them and, and stuff. And a lot of them were electroslide wells, okay? Then they had some other wells made by a process that Gurevich had also published on back in the early 70s, called, which we then called deep TIG. For tungsten and earth gas. And deep TIG is what Gurevich called, when it was translated into English, was always called semi-submerged art. Well, it wasn't really submerged arc like the one I showed you, which is one of the things that confused us. The Soviet papers never give you all the details, okay? They have two page papers. And, but semi-submerged arc, Gurevich had found that if you just put a, a little painted layer, half a millimeter thick, on the top surface of a piece of titanium to make a weld, and you use a tungsten torch, okay? You can get, with the flux, you can get uh, a deep weld, whereas if you had no flux there, you can get a very shallow weld. And to give you an example of that, this was made in our lab, with flux shielding on this one, let's see if I can blow this up. I mean, this is 30-year-old technology, folks. But I keep the samples for Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, so it focuses on and out. This weld on this side was made with 
fig that it had a flux on the surface. And it got, and I, it's hard to etch the titanium to see it. So I kind of dotted it in. That's the fusion line. This weld was made with TIG with no flux and got a big heat affected zone, but he only had exact same welding parameters, same current, volt, same travel speed. Okay, and what happens, and there was a lot of research done on this for stainless steels in the early 70s, you have a change in your convection pattern in the weld pool. So regular TIG will have a weld pool that's very shallow and the weld circulation pattern looks like that, okay? Hot metal comes up and then the hottest metal underneath the arc gets carried off to the side and widens the weld pool and you don't get a lot more depth. When you put the flux there, you get what's called Marangoni flow after an Italian physicist from the 18th century. But a surface tension driven blow, you change the surface tension of the metal and um, all of a sudden the convection takes the hot stuff right underneath the arc and pushes it down to the bottom. You get an hour deeper well. Well, this became a big area of research. A guy in uh, uh, the National Physical Laboratory in Britain, uh, Ken Mills, published a little one or two page paper saying he thought this was why these things, not in titanium, but in stainless steels, were changing the shape of the TIG well pools. And people started doing, people actually, they were doing research on this in the early 70s when I was at Buckham Steel. And I was sort of interested in it, but I hadn't applied it to titanium until after the alpha sub stuff when we were trying to figure out how they built that. But, um, there was getting to be lots of research, and this Professor Sikeli and I in 1983 uh, wrote a paper where we did some computer modeling of the convection flows in well pools, and we won an award for our paper. We were the first people to ever model that. For the next 15 years, everybody in the world who had a computer and didn't know how to do an experiment but could run a finite element program, they were doing bigger and better finite elements of convection in well pools. They didn't prove anything we didn't prove. Okay. And Ken Mills was the guy who first had the hypothesis. We just kind of did the calculations to show it. But in fact, this is what happens when you put the very thin, just paint on a little spurry of flux. It's only 20 thousandths of an inch thick. So it's kind of like welding through paint, and you get a very deep penetration. So it turns out, um, and then Ohio State University, which became one of the big welding schools, they had a welding department building. Uh, Named the university. There's Le Tourneau in Louisiana or Texas that you've never, most people have not heard of that has a welding program, four year welding program, welding engineering program. But Ohio State started doing a lot of stuff on this. Um, I, I decided, hey, it's getting too popular. I don't like to walk, work on popular things. There's a lot of smart competition out there. So I would walk away from things like that. Okay. And I go work on something else. When there was no one else working, it's a lot easier to make a big impression when there's no competition. Okay? That's that was my philosophy. So, if you were trying to weld a piece of two-inch thick titanium uh, in, let's say, the flat position rather than the vertical position, and you were a Soviet shipyard, what you might do, okay, is do a joint prep like this of two plates and put some little flux in here and use a tungsten electrode that might be six millimeters, the quarter inch diameter, and use a thousand amperes and melt a great big deep pool like that. And then you flip it over if you wanted, you might weld another one like this. And then you come along and you do filler wire and you, in four passes, you can weld a two inch plate. I won't tell you how I know that. But if I, if I was so in chip drift, that's what I might do. And okay. that's when you said the horizontal position? Yeah, yeah, this is the flat position. This is sort of like submerged arc, except it's not submerged, the arc's not submerged beneath the flux. It's just welding through the flux and changing the convection pattern of the well pool. Okay? And you could weld, if I was a Soviet, I'm, I could try to design a sub with vertical welds by submerged arc, flat position welds, okay? I can form my sheet. I still have to have a few other welds 
but I have to do the old-fashioned way with gas tanks and arc. Um, and the way you do something like that, in some cases, this is one of my favorite pictures that I wrote with this book. Um, wherever I put my arm. Um, here's guys inside of an argon filled vacuum chamber wearing the oxygen space suits to do a welding of titanium components in pure argon. Okay? Because you cannot tolerate air oxygen contamination when welding titanium. Okay? Typically, when I worked at the Naval Air Rework Facility in 1968 in, in Norfolk, Virginia, they would have a glove bag. And you, the guy would put his hands inside the glove bag with the, the disc that he had to repair well to the titanium, and he used gas pumps and arc to repair it. Very slow, but hey, TIG welding of the sea cliff was how they did the whole 8 inch diameter sphere, 2 inches thick. Okay? Because they didn't have, a, the U.S. Navy didn't have a better way to do it. They wanted to do it by gas metal arc, which is like submerged arc with the wire going in with the flux, but the flux cost too much. I had a chance in 1980 as one of the two people who went over, or was, was, well, Kelly and I went over, and I told him I went, we were going to go to Kiev, to the Khan Institute, and uh, I said, I want to talk to Garevich. And they were so eager to continue the exchange that Carter had set up, and Reagan was, Reagan was now shutting down, they granted us anything we wanted. I spent two hours with Garevich with a translator, okay, because I didn't speak Russian and Ukrainian, he didn't speak English. He was a wonderful man. He was not part of the system. He was just a scientist. And he had been told, quit publishing in 1972 because we're going to use the technology you've been working on for all these years and we're going to build something. And so we never heard of him again outside the Soviet Union. But he was a wonderful man, okay. He told me anything I wanted to know. And I had done enough work on it for a few years, I knew he was telling me the truth. And I asked him, well, how do you do gas metal art? He said, no, we don't understand. And I mean, there's a translator in between. And I, at first, I didn't understand. I said, I, kept, I asked the question about three times. No, no, no use. <laughs> okay? And they had done lots of work on gas metal art. This is what David Taylor and Annapolis had focused all their research money on was gas metal art. Okay? Because it was the most productive thing for steel. If the only tool you have is a hammer, you see every problem is a nail, right? Uh, and it turns out uh, we never saw any evidence that they had actually used gas metal arc in building their submarine. And I had a couple of students through the early 80s. I told you about Dan Reese, who was in your program, who you know, eventually retired as captain of Pearl Harbor shipyard. Dan was doing his, his master's thesis on gas metal arc welding titanium. Some of the stuff he did, he did high speed movies and looking at the metal transfer, how the little drops of metal melt off and stuff. It's unstable. It's an unstable process. You get spatter all over everywhere. Well, their, their, their methods don't work. I mean, what you say, like 10 years later, they had to retire their entire fleet due to some or hydrogen cracking. Well, from, no, no, hydrogen cracking. Due to creep fatigue interaction. Cracking, not hydrogen cracking. But the fact that the metal, titanium metal, if you put it under a constant compressive stress and then cycle it, okay, it'll grow cracks big time. The metal itself. The metal itself. That's the base metal. It wasn't the metal necessarily. There's nothing you can do to sort of find that out. Well, well the Naval Research metal. Laboratory had been working for years, and at this conference, this three-day conference down there at Annapolis, they came up to me, Tom, how they solve the creep fatigue interaction? I said, I don't know. And then we found out a couple years later that they, so we didn't know either. <laughs> okay, they didn't, they may not have even known about this, okay? Because we tend to do a better scientific job on the fundamentals in many cases. Uh, and NRL is a top, top flight laboratory. I mean, they've had two or three Nobel laureates come up with NRL. That's the whole concept of GPS was developed in NRL. Okay? So I'm just curious, you know, so at a, the shipyard, they all have that D not well for, you know, submarines like hull steel. And, you know, they have a groove on one side and they'll lay beads and beads and beads and then when they flip it, they'll back gouge out. And that whole, like, they go through such pains to make sure that they're getting a good, clean well service. Mm -hmm. And is that same thing happen in the process that you described here? They do any back gouging? Or is that yeah, the but they can't do it with oxygen. They have to grind it. So they grind it out and then lay the next. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And let me tell you that when you're doing Monel, 
in a submarine shipyard, they basically have to grind off the top layer because they get nickel oxides that you can't go in there and you know air or grind, grind it out. Uh, they have to grind the top surface of every well bead. Okay. Every bead. Every, every bead. Mm -hmm. So you're welding. If you, I mean, a lot of stuff they're doing is piping half inch thick. There's only a few beads. Sure. And if they're doing good TIG welding, they don't have to grind it on piping, so they don't have. To, if you're doing heavy section um, nickel based alloys, some bird dark and things like that, you have to grind off the top surface. And you only have to grind like ten ten thousandths. You just gotta get rid of that oxide layer on the surface, or otherwise it'll just melt in and create occlusions dirt in the, in the well zone. So, I mean, if nothing else, there's lots of details you haven't learned. Some of which you will learn when you take, if you take the solid state and the fusion welding things. But those really get into the process physics. Why do you use electrode positive? Why do you use electrode negative for this process? Um, um, how fast can you go with laser as opposed to, I mean, the Navy spent millions, if not a hundred million, trying to figure out to get, use lasers for high productivity in the shipyard. And you're not really using it. I mean, you may have some little laser welding cell the size of this room building some piping components or something in some place that, you know, but, but you're not going to use them out the, out the, on the ways, okay, in the dry dock. Why is that? Well, you have to take the course, but, uh, <laughs> but basically, um, the laser, you have to cordon off the whole area. You have to automate it, okay? Because the laser goes so fast with its high power density that no human can control it. You can't have a torch that has laser on it. Plus, you have the problem with reflected light. And you have to, you know, if you go to General Motors where they're using a laser, it'll be, or Boeing where they might be using a laser, it'll be locked out area, okay? And there'll be interlocks. No one can go in the area while the laser's on. The same thing you see in the laboratories around here flashing lights, laser on, don't enter the room. Okay, it's sort of like taking x-rays out in the shipyard. You gotta have 15 people standing watch to make sure some rat doesn't run in there and get a rainy bean. Oh, maybe he's not a rat, maybe he's an employee, but yeah. nonetheless, okay. I have to ask this question now. <laughs> because you're just on the segue, I'm gonna go for it. So bear with me. Have you seen the movie Elysium? No. Okay, so there's a guy, he's a worker, he's working in a robotics facility. Sci-fi shit, okay. But it goes in and they irradiate these metal frames, okay, yeah. these things. And I just always wondered, you know, is do the do the, the just was they were hardening them? Is radiation ever used for hardening or something, or is that complete complete sci-fi school? Well, radiation in a nuclear reactor hardens the steel vessel, and you have to scrap it after 30 years because it's been brittle. So yes, radiation will yeah, change the crystals, brittle. the crystal or the location of vacancies and the interstitials and the atoms in the crystal. But so far as hardening it. Um, I don't know of something hardening it. Um, we have used lasers. In fact, uh, Ben Wilcox is now going to be retired. Back in the 60s, when he was working at Patel, used high powered pulse lasers. If you hit something hard enough, you can actually blast it apart. You send stress waves of 300 KSI through the material, and you can stress relief. And we did some of that in the 90s, um, trying to use laser stress relief where you blast the material little pulses and all they do is leave a little divot on the surface which you can grind off. But you hit it so fast that you send a shock wave through the metal and that shock wave is a mechanical stress wave and you can stress, mechanically stress relief the material. Okay? So you can do things like that. You say it hits so hard or they get hard with photons? Yeah. The power density of 10 to the 8 watts per square centimeter. A laser electron beam never goes above 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7. You go up to 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, you're hitting the material with heat so fast that it can't melt, it just sublimes off the surface, it evaporates off the surface, but for every action there's an equal opposite reaction, and you start getting to 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, and you can knock missiles off their course with the reaction of hitting with a pulse laser beam. What do you think lasers in space is all about? They're not going to melt the warheads, okay? They might blast a hole through it, which could mess up some of the control circuitry. But one of the things they do is they're just going to knock it off course and give it a shock wave that just tears it apart. In fact, we didn't talk about this with armor. You know, the, the army can hit a, the, the suppose a tank round is not, you know, like 
the shells that you, well, actually, you guys use supposed to, okay? Um, but it could be a 36 inch long, three quarter inch diameter rod with depleted uranium, okay? And they're trying to use tungsten because it has high density. But the way it penetrates is a kinetic energy penetrator, just like your rail guns, okay? But um, it actually self sharpens its tip as it's penetrating. And you can go through as much steel as the length of the sabot. So I, I've seen down at Aberdeen Proving Ground 36 inches of steel penetrated, okay, um, by one shot, okay. Um, and I remember I had a student working over here at Watertown Arsenal for the Army, and he told me the story that in about 1984-85 they perfected the sabot sabots so that. There was no armor that couldn't be penetrated with one of these sabots. And in fact, they lined up three old tanks on the battlefield, and they had an artillery uh, general, I don't know how many stars he had, and they shot right through all six layers, shot through the side of all six tanks, lined up, okay? And apparently he tossed his cookies right there on the battlefield as he saw this. Because, you know, he was just afraid that some guy with a shoulder-mounted weapon, you know, like RPG or something, was going to be able to wipe out any of his tanks. Um, well, within two years, the whole thing had flipped. So there was no armor, or there was no, no munition that couldn't be defeated by the proper armor. But that's when they developed active armor. You guys know what active armor is? You need some force outward. What was yeah. the outward? Yeah, you basically have a surface of explosive on the outer part of your armor. So maybe your armor is two or three inches thick, whatever thick. It's got this little quarter inch layer of explosive. And when the sabot hits it, and it's going at what, four or 5,000 feet per second, I mean, it's going pretty fast, supersonic, right? It hits it, and the, the, the explosive goes off and sends a shock wave through that 36 inch diameter penetrator. And that shock wave, in addition to the force that's already on it, shatters it. It's already got stresses of a couple hundred thousand PSI on it when it hits, and you send another shock wave of a couple hundred thousand PSI, and the thing shatters. And they have high-speed movies, and you can see the thing hit, boop, it all breaks up into little pieces. That's nuts, because it's, uh, it's like this, the shock wave has to move the speed of sound to come out, I guess, an explosion. Yeah. Well, the speed of sound is 5,000 meters per second. Okay. You do the calculation and it all works out. Okay. But the I used to think that the army was sort of backward in the technology uh, compared to the Air Force and the Navy and stuff. But when I got on a couple of army science boards and actually saw what they were doing, they don't advertise a whole lot. When you get into the weapons area or the armor area and penetrators, it's pretty sophisticated stuff. So let me tell you. It really is. I sort of, this really is sort of, it's better than Star Wars, okay? Air Force has ideas that are just impossible. Those guys are, are watching too much sci-fi, okay? And they think that they can make sci-fi work. But, uh, That's a stupid idea. Um, the, uh, the Army actually comes up with practical things. Like, one of the things they did about, how do you defeat active armor? Go faster and speed of sound. No, you have a you have a, a sabot with caboose, right. and you have a round, okay. And the sabot comes off, but the, you have two penetrators. The first penetrator goes in, hits, gets exactly. shattered, and the other one falls through the hole. There's no more actor armor in that spot, right? Mm -hmm. Now one of the best armors is actually electromagnetic armor. You just hang wires off the side, and the thing comes in and sees some magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields. Can't remember exactly how it works there. <laughs> But um, I'll tell you the armor on the MRAPs. Okay, the armor on the MRAPs, um, I can tell you what it's made out of. They have about six inches of, uh, or six pieces of three quarter inch glass. That's the armor. Now I can't tell you why it works, because that is classified. And that is one of the times I've used my clearance. Uh, I've used my clearance three times. But anyway, um, I can't tell you why it works, but. They test this, well, that's an interesting story. So the Secretary of the Army, we, we were losing all kinds of soldiers after we took over Iraq to the weapons of mass, not mass destruction. We went there to get the weapons of mass destruction, which they couldn't find. 
the IED, IED, IED. IEDs. Okay. So we were losing soldiers to IEDs, and the, the, the Humvees were not resistant enough. And I don't want to take all the time to tell the whole story. But, but uh, so the Secretary of Army goes down to Aberdeen, and he says, you got to solve this problem. We're losing people. And uh, within a year and a half, we were not losing any more soldiers who were out there, you know, foot soldiers, to the IEDs. And one of the things they did is they had a 4 o'clock conference call every Friday afternoon with the commanders in the field. So the scientists, I mean, most, most government laboratories, if they are given a strong mission, they can produce, okay? But then they just, after they've solved that problem, they just continue to exist. And then they're just a, uh, they're a, 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 a trash can. Well, you just throw money into it and burn it, okay? Just burn it, okay? Because they don't have a mission. And I used to see that at Army when they were over here in Watertown Arsenal. and look at what they were doing. The Secretary of the Army came in to have the improvement ground and said, you've got to solve this problem. And of course, then they had to get the resources, but they already had most of the resources in the budget. But then they knew what their, their problem was that they had to solve. And in a year and a half, they solved it through all kinds of different methods. They didn't use just one technique. But they got the feedback, and they put some things, prototyped very quickly into the field, tried them, and they get feedback on whether they worked or not, and how what was wrong with them from the, from the captains and lieutenants and whatever that were out there, you know, out searching for the, the devices. Staying on the on-flat side, I've been some time in Afghanistan. One of the problems we're having is where our Canadian vehicles are, um, are equivalent of Humvees or Humvee weapons or whatever. Uh, they were getting uh, punctured as well as our uh, like armored vehicles. They're only right up to about a level two, you know, main tanks. So they're basically getting punctured by the called EFP, supposedly for the fair house, okay. um, which is basically just a copper. Uh, Curveball of copper inside of an exposed container that's forming. I mean, it's a very low tech thing that was really causing us. It's actually higher tech than you think. Well, okay, but, okay, but, go but, ahead. Um, I was just wondering if anyone had solved that problem. Yes, they did. In fact, that's where the glass came in. What happened is in this rush program, the Secretary of the Army gave them, a, gave them a problem to solve. They went out and they tried titanium, steel, aluminum, glass. And they tried five or six things. So I was in a review panel, and they were telling us the story about how they did all this. And you have like 40 or 50 people around. Half of them are the Army people, half of them are the review panel, the National Academies, and I was on that. And this woman got up to explain how she first did a screening study. Let's just take some, some of these uh, RPGs and fire them at this, these layers of armor and see what works, and what are we going to put on the bottom of our our MRAPs, which are bigger than the Humvees. And what worked best was glass. And you don't usually think that a brittle material is going to be your best thing. But if you, the reason I can tell you it's glass, because any Army soldier out there running around in an MRAP can see that it's just painted glass. Okay? And by doing maintenance on it, you can't classify that anymore. Okay? But why it works is classified. Okay? But it does work. It defeats things even better. And while we go ahead and take a little break, I'll go get one of those little sort of things. Okay? And so we can talk about why that works.